Bungie began by copying Atari, developing exclusively for the Mac. However, they quickly evolved into a powerhouse of brilliant and innovative game design. Most of you watching have likely been introduced to Bungie through Halo or Destiny, but there exists a large body of work that you might have missed, either from being too young or too busy playing Doom and System Shock. It'd be a shame to ignore an entire decade of blood, sweat, and tears that Bungie had to endure to reach Halo. And so, my name is Same Token, and you're watching the first episode of a four-part series exploring the early days of Bungie, from a couple of college graduates working beside a crack house to one of the top game developers in the world. This is Before Halo, Bungie's Origins. Bungie began in 1991 with a clone of Atari's Pong. A young Alex Seropian had been pursuing his interest in programming by taking a mathematics degree that specialized in computer science. Shortly before graduation, he was sleeping on his father's couch wondering what he wanted to do with his life. Debating on whether to get a job or try earning money on his own, he asked his father for advice. Of course, this advice was to gain experience with an established company first. So, naturally, he completely ignored this, deciding instead to strike out on his own and become a video game developer. Seropian determined that surely it's better to be the man than to work for the man. After agonizing over what to call his new company, he settled on Bungie because it sounded fun. As the proud owner of a Macintosh, Seropian decided to create a Mac clone of the then 20-year-old Pong, calling it Nop which the eagle-eyed of you may have noticed is indeed Pong spelled backwards. You had your paddles and your ball. Yep, that's Pong. Except in this game, when you lose, you can hear Seropian himself laughing at your misery. <laughs> Although it was distributed as shareware over the internet, which meant most people probably got it for free, a few people took him up on his offer of Nop's source code for $15. This reaction was small. There was still a long journey between Nop and Halo, but Bungie had its first game, and Seropian hungered for more. Seropian immediately turned to figuring out his next project to publish under Bungie, something more ambitious than Pong spelled backwards. After spending a great deal of time researching modern tank warfare, he landed on creating a top-down tank shooter, again for the Macintosh. Released in October of 1991, it was titled Operation Desert Storm after the conflict of the same name, and it featured 20 brutally hard levels. While the graphics weren't quite at the same level as other Macintosh games at the time, such as Simant and Hellcats, it was single-handedly crafted by Seropian himself, who also boxed and shrink-wrapped the copies in his apartment. With it being an unknown game from an unknown publisher, he had a hard time finding distributors. But despite this, Seropian still managed to sell 2,500 copies of Operation Desert Storm. Not a huge amount, but Bungie was officially making some money. Shortly after the release of Operation Desert Storm, Seropian was looking for another game to publish. As it turned out, a friend he had met in an artificial intelligence class, Jason Jones, had been working on a game of his own. A top-down, tile-based fantasy game in the vein of the Ultima series with one big difference. It was multiplayer only. Jones had just been creating it on the Apple II so he could play with friends. He had no real intention of bringing it to market. However, stopping by Jones's dorm room, Seropian persuaded him to clean it up and sell it. Now keep in mind, this was in the days before multiplayer games were the norm. This was something special. Naming it Minotaur Labyrinths of Crete, Seropian started creating the packaging and marketing, while Jones worked on readying it for commercial distribution from December 91 until it shipped in the spring of 92. Like with Seropian's game the year before, they struggled to find distributors for Minotaur, instead resorting to selling it at trade shows and direct to the consumer. Eventually though, some distributors did take an interest, 
but once again, it only managed to sell 2,500 copies. Mac gaming wasn't exactly booming, PC had always been the dominant platform, so it was never destined to sell big. At this point, Bungie had sold a total of just 5,000 games. Yet, what this really meant was a couple of guys out of college sold 5,000 games, and better yet, Minotaur quickly garnered a hardcore fanbase. After all, it was the very first network-only game released on the Macintosh. Multiplayer wasn't just an afterthought, it made up the very fabric of the game. Minotaur's small success netted Seropian and Jones enough money to become convinced that they had to get serious and create something bigger. And so, a partnership was born. In the summer of 1992, Jason Jones experienced Wolfenstein 3D on a PC, which offered a 3D graphics engine that was described by critics as frighteningly realistic. In that moment, Jones thought, surely a Mac could do all of that. This inspired him to program his own 3D graphics engine for the Mac, which could simulate corridors using rectangles and trapezoids. It was basic, but it formed the basis of what would become their next game. At first, this was to be Minotaur 3D, but it was quickly decided that, as the game relied on the top-down perspective, it wouldn't really work in a 3D environment. And at the same time, they wanted to create a single-player experience. Minotaur's network-only nature was perhaps a little ahead of its time, and this wasn't doing them any favors financially. So, they had to come up with something new. Jones would often swing by Seropian's apartment to shrink-wrap copies of Minotaur while eating his food. On one visit, Jones finally narrowed down his plans for the engine he was working on. A 3D, first-person shooter with a handful of role-playing elements he called Pathways into Darkness. Seropian immediately jumped on this idea. He knew a good thing when he saw it. So, Jones quickly began work on Pathways, recruiting his friend, Colin Brent, to create the artwork. By day, Jones coded on his Macintosh 2 FX, and by night, Colin would come over and work on the graphics. Rather than throwing players into a dungeon to kill monsters with no real context, Jones wanted to create a compelling backstory. An alien god buried deep beneath a Mesoamerican pyramid is beginning to wake up. Humanity is warned by another alien race called the Jaro, who claim they wouldn't be able to reach Earth fast enough to help, and so the humans themselves must neutralize the god before it wakes up and wipes them out. And so began Bungie's theme of creating backstories of epic proportions. Pathways was shaping up to be a technological marvel, far superior to most of its competitors on the Mac platform. And at Macworld Boston, Pathways was demonstrated to the world, proving that the Mac was just as capable as PCs at running games. Yes, it wasn't pushing the envelope nearly as much as Id's Doom, which was released around the same time on MS-DOS. But for a Mac game, this was a quantum leap. As they neared completion, Seropian and Jones had fairly modest hopes for Pathways. Affording the luxury of real food again was their primary goal. However, come its release date in August of 93, they received far more than a well-stocked kitchen. Pathways Into Darkness was met with critical acclaim, winning Inside Mac Games Adventure Game of the Year, as well as being included in Macworld's Game Hall of Fame. And of course, the greatest trophy of all, money. Bungie's cash flow situation was remedied, and they were finally carving a name for themselves in the world of Macintosh gaming. Pathways into Darkness looked brilliant. Critics lauded the high-resolution graphics setting, which Mac User Magazine considered gorgeous, especially with Colin Brent's detailed and interesting artwork. Later updates would also support textured floors and ceilings on the newer PowerPC hardware, making Pathways even more visually appealing. 
Some critics felt its user interface, which used system windows for things like the viewport and inventory, was simple and elegant. However, while intuitive, it wasn't as neat as keeping all the interfaces within the game, leaving it looking more SimCity 2000 than something like Ultima Underworld. Regardless, back then it was the wild west of first-person games with RPG elements, and Pathways into Darkness deserves to be remembered for its part in shaping the genre. Orally, Pathways was a treat. Up to three-channel stereo was supported when using external speakers. And in this case, sound is essential if you want to survive, with each monster making a unique noise. Which brings us to the gameplay, which was described as highly addictive. In their review, Inside Mac Games magazine stated that while most games claim they get your heart pounding, Pathways actually delivers. However, this was sometimes to a fault. Pathways into Darkness is incredibly difficult. So difficult, in fact, that Bungie themselves ended up having to publish an official hint book. Ammunition is sparse, so you'll often have to resort to your knife. And because you move so slowly, and the corridors are so thin, many attacks become impossible to dodge. Even if you do have enough ammunition, it's easy to become overwhelmed by the sheer number of enemies populating the map. With save locations being few and far between, the game can become fairly tedious when you've died a couple of times. Jason Jones retrospectively agreed that it was harder than your typical adventure game, and that the window-based interface was a little too complicated, especially for those without multiple monitors. Overall though, Pathways was a great game. It boasted brilliant graphics and fun, if frustrating, gameplay. It had a great sense of humor that would become a lovable bungee staple, ultimately building a following that has lasted to this day. And you can see this with Pathways into Darkness being faithfully ported to Mac OS X by Man Up Time Studios in 2013. Available for free on the Mac App Store, the port remains compatible with modern 64-bit Macs, ensuring Pathways into Darkness doesn't get lost to time. Bungie had finally found success in a formula that they would greatly improve on with their next game, Marathon. From a clone of Pong and a multiplayer RPG to a fully-fledged 3D shooter, Bungie were solidified as a notable Macintosh game developer. Mac gamers had taken notice and were waiting in anticipation for whatever Bungie would come up with next. Be sure to check out episode 2 of Before Halo, where we explore the game that catapulted Bungie to new heights, finally placing them toe-to-toe -to -toe with games like Doom. It's still a long path to Halo, but as we continue to move through Bungie's early games, the influence on why Halo looked and felt the way it did will become clear. And so, thank you so much for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe and hit the bell icon to make sure that you don't miss any future episodes. Stay safe out there, and I'll catch you next time.